Hey everyone, welcome back to the 443 Security Simplified. I'm your host, Mark the Liberty, and joining me today is... Corey, I love long documents, not Grinder. <laughs> as, as Corey is hinting at, today we are giving you our book report on the national cybersecurity strategy that just came out of the White House last week. We're going to focus the whole episode on it, going through all 39 pages, and give you our thoughts on what our country is proposing as a strategy to combat cybersecurity going forward. So without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, roll our way in. So let's start with the, uh, I guess, big and only topic we will be discussing this week. <laughs> I was going to say start with, <laughs> let's jump and, into the with. only topic. <laughs> on, uh, on today's episode, we're going to be chatting about the just released, at least as of this recording, uh, White House National Security Cybersecurity Strategy document. Uh, so at the time of you listening to this, it's last week, the White House released this strategy document, which is basically a 40-page report that lays out relatively high-level but extremely thorough uh, a path to addressing cybersecurity threats impacting not just the government, but also private organizations and citizens, and not even just in the United States, but it also, you'll see, goes over international relations as well, too. Um, so unlike some of the previous government or White House-led topics we've chatted about on this podcast recently, this one isn't like an executive order that takes immediate action right now or like legislation that's going to uh, cause like regulation immediately. It's more of a, as the name says, strategy. It's basically, yeah, them signaling what their stance is on certain issues and then still laying out the groundwork of what they expect to work on with like Congress and federal agencies and international partners to try and close gaps that they see in our nation's both private and public cybersecurity strategy. But like, so before we even jump into it, I, I do like that they've released this report, uh, like at least this game plan, because in the world of cybersecurity, it's really easy to get stuck in situations where you feel like you're just shooting at the hip and living day to day. And for them to like take a step and come out with this, in my opinion, well-formulated plan or strategy as high level as it is, like it's good. It shows like at least a concerted effort to address a lot of the stuff that you, I, and everyone else in the industry have been screaming about for the last decade. Um, so the report itself, it starts out by describing just like the context of the cyber world we're in. It talks about how uh, we're entering a new phase of deepening digital dependencies that are going to unlock possibilities for human prosperity for the words it used. But recognizing that that also multiplies the risks that we face for insecure if we have insecure systems. Uh, highlights the software that the systems we're using is growing more complex, often uh, but often too brittle because of that too. Uh, they highlighted like NotPetya as an example, where one organization, so Russia, attacking one region, the Ukraine, spilled over and caused billions of dollars of damages worldwide. And they also highlight that threat actors have evolved from like the nuisance of you know script kitties and website defacement and piracy and things like that to straight up espionage and extremely damaging attacks against organizations and infrastructure alike. They even specifically called out China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea with their reckless disregard for the rule of law, and China specifically as a, a major uh, actor in the space targeting United States and uh, its citizens and partners. So, and by the way, to add to that, they also mentioned things like critical infrastructure. You know, when they're talking about the complexity and in our increased dependency, obviously, critical infrastructure, water, power, all that, and IoT. Even from a consumer level, just adding to that, you know, the fact that everyone is getting high speed internet now, but it's not just computers, but IoT is just adding to that complexity and brittle brittleness as well. I was going to say brutality. Brutality. <laughs> brutality, like brutality. Oh, yes, the brutality. <laughs> yeah. very is posh way of more. saying. <laughs> Brittleness still doesn't, I don't know. I'm by no means a grammar <laughs> expert, so whatever. We'll take it with whatever you, you spit out. Um, but like overall, so I we read through the report, and there's a lot of like, a lot of stuff that's like, you know, that's following along with what they've been not just saying, but doing over the last few years. But there's also some like fundamental like shifts in how they try to address or want to try and address some situations going forward. 
And so we'll spend this episode going through the report. It's broken up into five main pillars and two major shifts, as they call them. Uh, go through exactly what they are and kind of give our, you know, typical cynical, but sometimes happy uh, response of how we, uh, what our thoughts are in each individual spot. Um, let's first start though with the two, uh, what do they call them? Um, fundamental shifts in how the United States allocates roles, responsibilities, and resources in cyberspace. So the first one they labeled as rebalance the responsibility to defend cyberspace. And this is all boils down to right now, it falls almost entirely on the end user when it comes to mitigating cyber risks. So the organization that buys the product or software, they're the ones that have to make sure they set it up correctly, defend against whatever Swiss cheese holes it has in it. Um, and if they screw up, it can cause damaging consequences, not just to their company, but the entirety of the United States, depending on what sector they're in. Uh, there was a quote from the paragraph describing this that I like, where it says, uh, individuals, small businesses, state, local, and governments, uh, infrastructure operators have limited resources and competing priorities, yet these actors' choices can have significant impact on our national security. Our collective cyber resilience cannot rely on the constant vigilance of our smallest organizations and individual citizens, which is straight into the point. And like it, it fundamentally makes sense. Um, so their proposal for this is shifting it from being entirely on the, the consumer, the end user, the small organization, and put some of that burden back on the actual uh, companies that manage our data and the technology providers that help build and service these systems um, and make it more their responsibility, responsibility as well, too. And actually, so we'll get into it a little bit later in pillar number three when we get to it and exactly what they mean by that. Um, but... Like at a high level, it, it conceptually makes sense. Like that's that's how we have to solve part of this issue, I think. Um, the second major shift is realign incentives to favor long-term investments. This basically boils down to like a lot of government incentive programs, a lot of just the way business works. It's all very short-sighted on fix this current issue and we'll deal with the rest later. And they're trying to rebalance and realign the economy to incentivize long-term planning and visions with cybersecurity. Because the reality is we can't fix all these issues short-term. It's going to take time to build out supply chains, build out infrastructure, research new things too. By the way, to put it another way, I, if, if not even thinking about the government, but if you look at any business, cybersecurity is always considered a cost center, right? It's normally not directly driving to the economy, to the business, to the government. But it's not just a cost center, as the government has figured out. It can, it, it may not make revenue or make your economy grow, but it can be used to make your economy decline because of attacks. So I think the idea of because it is a cost center, it may not directly contribute to a school's business, healthcare's business. The idea of tying incentives to make it worth the cost. You know what I mean? I really like that they're tying incentives where. Yeah, we get that cybersecurity is a cost, but if you do this, you can have monetary incentives that will help with it. So, and I, they specifically I, call out like trying to make it minimal, like the amount of invasive actions they have to do, but ones that will cause the greatest gains in defensibility and resilience along the yeah. way too. So they're mindful that you know you don't want to just turn the whole dang thing on its head and watch it flail, or just pump money into it. The reality is you need to be still selective and. Um, it's the word I'm looking for. I don't know, strategic on how you invest into it in order to get the biggest bang for your buck. Get return and investment. Exactly. Um, so how are they going to create these two shifts or have these come to fruition? Uh, so they broke it out into like five main pillars. Again, describing their, not just like plans for the future, but in some cases, just their stance on what their belief is in certain domains of cybersecurity affecting not just federal government or critical infrastructure, but all the way down to, you'll see the consumer and again, international relations too. And let's dive into the first pillar, which they call defend critical infrastructure, which if you're the federal government, this totally makes sense to have this be your first pillar, uh, because if something were to affect our critical infrastructure, it can cause devastating consequences. Like we saw with Colonial Pipeline, you know, a pipeline that I personally had never heard of until a couple of years ago, and then suddenly it gets hit with ransomware and you just watch the entire East Coast of the United States effectively erupt into chaos, at least in terms of gasoline and energy distribution. 
Um, so makes sense that they would target this one. And so this pillar, it's all about just strengthening the critical infrastructure sectors, as they say, through collaboration and through distributing risk and responsibility. And you'll see those are two themes across the entirety of this strategy. It's all built around public and private collaboration, encouraging private to private collaboration where possible, and then uh, making it so the entire burden isn't on a single organization, but spread out as much as possible. And so within these pillars, they've got different sections that go into a little more specific details. So within the first pillar, they've got 1.1, which is establish cybersecurity requirements to support national security and public safety. Um, so they mentioned that for the most part, like there's a few recent examples where it's not the case, but for the most part, a lot of critical infrastructure cybersecurity requirements are all voluntary. Um, so they've set up like, here's the standard you should follow. But you know, if you don't, there's no backslap to you because you didn't follow it. Now, it's changed a little bit recently. We've seen in like gas distribution and aviation and rail. And as of yesterday, I think, or today, uh, water distribution. There are some enforced like requirements now instead of voluntary measures. Um, but they're effectively calling in the section for regulatory frameworks that can recognize be nimble enough and tailored to each uh, sector's specific risk profile, but still harmonized enough to reduce duplication across the board. Basically saying, you know, we've done as much as we can, and it's worked in some cases, at least in small cases with voluntary rules, but it's time to start having required regulations for critical infrastructure. And so they're, they state they want to work with Congress to close gaps where the federal department's authority can't implement some of these requirements. They want to work with existing state and independent regulators where they're better positioned in order to put in uh, new requirements. But then also recognizing regulators must work with the actual regulated entities to understand not just, you know, what are the consequences of this, but how are they going to be paid for effectively? Because in a lot of these industries, the margins are like extremely thin. And if suddenly you've got like, you know, a whole bunch of cybersecurity regulations on it with no incentives or grants or anything to go with it, it could be just absolutely crippling. So this one, it makes sense. And like I hinted at, like a lot of these are grounded off events or patterns that they're already doing. So there are, we already saw the transition starting from voluntary to now required regulations and critical infrastructure. So it makes sense to see this one. Yeah, it makes total um, sense to me. I think the biggest problem is not making them onerously burdensome. I, 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 you know, I think if you go across America, there's people that think there should be no regulation at all. And there's people that think regulation is the only way to fight corruption and negligence. And I, I think you pointed out that it's really the middle ground. I think even the government doesn't want to take the time, money and expense to regulate things that the public can do well on their own or that, you know, in this case, the critical infrastructure important to society companies or organizations can do on their own. And the, we want to be hands off as a as any societal government as much as possible. But if people continually or if organizations continually prove negligence that, yeah, you know what you're supposed to be doing on your own, but over and over and over again, people can't aren't, you do have to regulate. So I think this will be kind of a balancing act. And I like your point of the the issue with regulation, though, is it does sometimes introduce new costs. And and when you go too far on regulation, it can be onerous to the, the organizations trying to follow it. So it'd be interesting to see what the actual regulations become and how they're incentivized, how, how the government might help or even fund following them for the critical infrastructure organizations. And you'll see throughout a lot of this that they're likely going to lean on NIST to develop frameworks and then regulations and rules will be built around. Are you following NIST's framework or something similar? Not surprising um, as that has been the National Institutes of yes. Standards and Technology forever. <laughs> uh, so number 1.2 is scale public-private collaboration. And they're basically just saying build off of what CISA has already been doing with sector risk management agencies and continue to strengthen information sharing and analysis centers, ISACs, and information sharing and analysis organizations, or ISAOs. Um, again, because if you can share threat intelligence, share learnings taken away from activity or incident response, 
you raise the overall tide with everyone else around you too. Yeah, and we, me and Mark can attest to this from our experience with the FBI CISO Academy, which while it's the FBI, they're very coordinated with CISA. But in general, all the government and, you know, we talked to a lot of high level government folks, including Chris Inglis, who's now retired, but was the head of, you know, our entire national security. And they are leaning, they have been leaning heavily in public private collaboration. They've, they, they understood that, you know, all these organizations existed before, but from the vendor or critical infrastructure organization side, it always felt like we were doing a lot of collaboration from our side or data sharing, but the government was more secretive about it. But that seems to have, you know, they're not. They're actually doing true collaboration and information sharing. So I like to see that this uh, strategy continues that, that more equal public-private collaboration. And while this section is just focused on critical infrastructure, like exactly what you just talked about, core is also covered later in other as well sections. too. Yep. Yep. One point three is integrate federal cybersecurity se- uh, cybersecurity centers. So they're saying directly connect federally run organizations like the Joint Cyber Defense uh, Collaborative at CISA with private sector organizations, and they call out other collaborations between federal orgs and sector risk management agencies too. Basically, the goal is. They want to be able to share information, like you just said, quickly with private organizations, because as we've seen, as Corey and I have experienced, like sometimes it can take a while to get information from federal government agencies that might be useful. Um, and they're, they recognize that and they're trying to speed a lot of that up now. By the way, very practically, I don't know if uh, many of you like us are probably subscribed to CISA alerts and, and other government alerts like U.S. CERT. Just the volume and quantity of the number of stuff that they quickly get from TLP Red down to clear and share through the, that emailing system has increased, in my opinion, in the past two years. So you can see that this strategy is something they've started. By the way, total joke aside, but we think the security industry sucks with acronyms. We've already used so many like CISA, but sector risk management agencies, SRMAs, uh, CTIIC, NCI, JTF, JCDC. What the heck, man? (laughs) I thought InfoSec was bad. The government has more acronyms than I will ever remember. At least I know what the DOE is. Twice as long to read this damn forty-page report because I kept having to go back to remember where they yes. defined the acronym. And be because like, okay, we what is that? <laughs> write stuff ourselves, we know the proper way to define the acronym the first time, and then you use it. I love that, but you're right. There's I, I had to literally scroll back up to remind myself what a SRMA was, even though they did properly define it the first time. Yep. Anyway, too many acronyms in cybersecurity. Uh, One dot four. Yeah, and government, clearly. Uh, Update federal incident response plans and processes. And so this is all about, they recognize that as the federal government, they've got a lot of resources. Uh, And because of that, they're in a position to provide assistance when required. Um, So their goal is to do that in a way that is unified, coordinated, what they call this whole of government response. Basically, there's a few things that this section covers. They want to make sure that organizations know which government agencies to contact and when. And what their purpose is, make sure it's all clearly documented and with guidance from the government and with what kind of support you can expect to get from those different agencies. Uh, they also say the federal government's going to direct CISA to update the National Cyber Incident Response Plan to, quote, to more fully realize the policy that uh, a call to one is a call to all. Uh, they will take lessons from the success of the Joint Terrorism Task Forces and coordinating local field offices with incident response, basically recognizing that it's not like you're going to call up the White House for help. You're going to call your local FBI field office or CISA representative or whatever, and they need to be able to coordinate within their agencies and other agencies across the whole of the federal government. And they also called out CIRCIA, so the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act uh, from last year, as a mechanism for enabling quicker and more effective response as well, too. Basically, if critical infrastructure agencies have to report vulnerable or attacks more quickly, it allows the government to learn about them and respond more quickly as well. So this one, it, it's good to see them. Like, I mean, it's, I feel like if you were to call up the FBI as a critical infrastructure or CISA or whatever, you would get help. But it's good to see they want to make sure they've got a good concerted effort. Uh, where you don't necessarily have to cut through red tape, where 
you know, each agency has its own capabilities and their own jurisdiction and making sure that they're all coordinated with what they can do to help respond as well. That said, like, this is one where I feel like I, it's going to take a lot of work to get the entire federal government chugging as one unit in incident response or something. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I don't, I, it's not their exact fault. I mean, it's a, such a large organization with bureaucracy. I can even say, like, for instance, within organizations like the FBI, the, uh, is it Internet Consumer Crime Center? I, I, I see squared, or I, not squared, I see three, I see three uh, does not necessarily stay in sync with the actual cybercrime unit that, you know what I mean? We we have incidents where we report to one and the other may not be in the same agency. So getting other intra-agency communication uh, up to speed should be easier than extra agency communication. So this is probably a big thing, but I'm glad they're considering it. And hopefully it will help them with their own incident response, which might get us to 1-5. Yeah. So the final section for pillar one is modernize federal defenses. Basically, they want to drive long term efforts to defend the federal government itself and all of its other executive branches along the way. So they identified that right now, federal civilian executive branches, another acronym, FCEBs, uh, these agencies, they independently manage their own IT and OT systems. And that is a problem uh, because... Sometimes they don't have the resources to do it. They all end up with different setups. Yes, they may all be running wrong. like Einstein, which is CISA's uh, IDS engine, but you have different, potentially different Defenses, firewalls, different configs, setups. different, yeah. And so they want to try and drive from the federal level, like a, at least in terms of cybersecurity, oversight and or management of some of these systems across the entirety of the federal government. I think this is an important one to get extra to get private when we get to three and other pillars to get the outside world to take accountability and help the government needs to prove that they can do it right and with just the u.s marshal service having a breach and that's just the one that happened what four days ago five days ago there there have been many so i i do think the government needs to do this because many government entities including the most uh, secure one like the nsa has had in incidents before uh, and two if you're starting to regulate and ask others to do the right thing you got to lead by example so i do think it's very important for them to kind of be a leader in this and hopefully have less of these public breaches that the world learns about and they call to it the a government few specifics too. Yeah. yeah. Like they said, for state and federal governments, they must replace or update their IT and OT systems that are not defensible against sophisticated uh, threats. Uh, they call it a few things like they no must. No more implement... Windows XP. <laughs> exactly. Must implement MFA, encrypt data, and gain visibility into full attack services. And then to your point with NSA's network, they even said specifically develop a new plan for defending the national security systems or NSS, basically our most critical uh, computer networks at the federal government level. So the, you're, I think you're absolutely right on that one, that in order, and they actually mentioned that throughout the report too, that in order to drive cybersecurity adoption and innovation, like the government needs to lead, uh, which historically they have not for not lack of trying, but just lack of resources, red tape, like there's a lot of hoops to jump through. So I agree. I mean, I have a new respect for some agencies. We know the capabilities of some people we've met personally, which are good. But to be honest, I feel like in general, especially when you get to local, not just federal, but governing agencies, cybersecurity techniques seem to be lagging private in many cases. So I would love to see them lead. And I think it'd be important when they start to regulate. Yep. So moving on now, pillar two is titled Disrupt and Dismantle Threat Actors. And this whole pillar, <laughs> rah, rah, America, uh, it's all about Screw using- Screw America. I, they're going to go with other state, you know, get all the international agencies to help Correct. with this. They're threat so, actors in any country. Yes. It's all <laughs> about using criminal. every means. So diplomatic, informational, military, both kinetic and cyber, financial, intelligence, and even law enforcement to go after threat actors. Um, so this one- uh, the first bit in it, 2.1, is integrate federal disruption activities. Uh, so there's a quote from here. So it's disruption uh, campaigns must become so sustained and targeted 
that criminal cyber activity is rendered unprofitable and foreign threat actors no longer see it as an effective means of achieving their goals. And that, I like this call out because we've seen now the gloves have come off with like the FBI specifically and a lot of federal government agencies where they'll go do a proactive takedown or a technical whatever to go take a ransomware operator offline or Emotet or whatever. But I don't know about you, Corey, but to me, it always feels like it's a kind of one-off, yeah, we did it. And it's like, oh yeah, now we're done. But every time you and I mention, you know, that they're going to come back at some Threat point. Threat actor comes back, yeah, yeah. And so this is specifically recognizing that they're going to come back and they need to continue these disruption yeah. efforts over and over and over until it's just no longer profitable. And I think disrupting the money is what will really get some of the groups, which they'll talk about later, I'm sure you'll cover. I will say things like Hive, the Hive takedown, are showing that they are, you know, Emotet may have come back in different variants with different groups, but Hive was a really great takedown you know, getting some of the money back, but also the decree. Yeah. So they're getting better. You can see them getting better. Um, and they are, for, for good or bad, have been taking the gloves off and, and using new legal, they're still legal ways of doing it, but using more aggressive new legal tactics to start to do these takedowns, which is great. And part of this is also, so they're specifically calling on the Department of Defense uh, to develop and update departmental cybersecurity strategies for operations and efforts to defend against state and non-state actors capable of posing risk to our country. Basically saying, yeah, right now they've been doing it through the DOJ, but in some of these cases, as you and I have talked about previously, like the nation state activity and even just individuals in hostile nation states can pose significant risk to our country, like bordering on what kinetic warfare could cause. So it makes sense to get the DOD involved as well, too, for a proactive measure to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and then they also call on federal government, the federal government to develop technological and organizational platforms to enable these coordinated operations, too. So they've already done a good job of just firing them away. But it sounds like they want to have this whole concerted effort now where they can effectively permanently disrupt certain actors if they choose to. Um 2.2 is enhanced public-private operational collaboration to disrupt adversaries. So they specifically called out a few previous engagements with the private sector, uh, like Emotet as an example, where a lot of the help for that came from the private sector because they're often in a better position to view the adversary activity than the federal government thanks to their scale or even just their rapid pace of innovation. And so it calls on the government to work more closely with the private sector for these operations, but also private organizations to band together into nonprofit organizations, as they call them, that can serve as hubs for basically the government to come in and work with them to go take down a threat actor. And we Makes have sense. some direct experience here that this type of public-private operation can help. Yeah. By absolutely. the way, I, I like 2.3, too, which is the increasing the speed and scale of intelligence sharing and victim notification. For me, it's more the intelligence sharing. I, I, I hinted out, I won't talk about it in a ton of detail, but Cyclops Blink was our opportunity as a, a private vendor to work with the FBI, CISA, the NSC, and, and take down uh, Russian state-sponsored actors, uh, you know, threat. Uh, but the one thing was, you know, we learned that the government knew about this long before we actually were brought in to help. And so if uh, all of that whole experience was good and really allowed us to, you know, our, us do our part to help our customers and the FBI help take down a command and control centers for, for this threat that was affecting a small portion of customers. But we would have loved to, the, the, my only complaint was we would have loved to start the help earlier so that we could have released the mitigation even faster. So I, I think when this was happening, you know, past public-private collaborations was the government getting a lot from the other side, but not giving a lot because of all the secrecy. They have been forced to kind of institutionally for a while, but the fact that they're actually opening up this threat intelligence is going to allow them to share faster and maybe pull in private organizations faster too, which will just help everyone. So I like to think that this section is strictly because yours and my feedback to uh, our, our friends at the federal government. <laughs> I'm sure it was the Emotet folks too, but we definitely did talk about, I, I mean, we really appreciate the public, you know, we did, I would say like a lot of businesses, 
at first we weren't sure if we wanted to collaborate with the government because of things you hear, but it turned out to be a fantastic experience. The that being one of our only complaints, so it's it's hard not to feel some credit for two three, but I doubt it. it obviously, it was not just us. Everyone agrees that speed helps. I'm still going to think it was just us. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> two dot that, That's why you have that award sitting behind you, Mark. Exactly. Signed by yep. uh, the director of the FBI. Yep. <laughs> Uh, 2.4, prevent abuse of U.S.-based infrastructure. And so this one recognizes a lot of attacks targeting U.S. and partner organizations take, like, originate or at least get proxied through infrastructure based in the United States. And so it calls on working with cloud and infrastructure as a service providers to quickly identify malicious use of U.S.-based infrastructure and take action. Um, and also, they're going to begin enforcing a risk-based approach to cybersecurity across I IAS, IAAS <laughs> providers, infrastructure as a service, which makes sense. And we've talked about this in like a prediction a couple of years ago now about crackdown on abusing cloud services, in this case, the context of phishing. But it does seem like like they could potentially be doing, I mean, it's easy for me to say from my ivory tower, but I feel like. They could be doing more to quickly act on some of this, identify on, proactively and act on some of this. Yeah, it's very clear. Even if a foreign nation state sponsored actor were to attack the U.S., they wouldn't do so coming from infrastructure in their country. It's really, I, I mean, most of them will actually take over infrastructure in the country they're attacking. And it looks like the attack is coming from within. Uh, so I, I think it's nice that the government has the ability to... Uh, quickly uh, fix such internal abuses. Exactly. Because you can geo-block all of Russia's IP space, but I mean, That's as long not as AWS block and Azure actors. and Google Cloud and Linode don't do it, it's not going to block them. Because don't, don't, don't worry, Mark. I'm sure people in Russia don't know how to use a VPN. So let's go then 2.5, which is counter cybercrime, defeat ransomware. And it basically, they start by going over four main lines of effort by the federal government to combat ransomware. Uh, leverage international cooperation to disrupt the ecosystem and isolate countries that provide safe havens. Investigate ransomware crimes mm. using law enforcement. Mm. Yeah, which countries are I wonder are which those? countries those are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> using law enforcement authorities to disrupt actors. Uh, bolster critical infrastructure resilience to withstand attacks. And address the abuse of virtual uh, currency to launder ransomware payments. So the first ones, they make sense. The last one actually kind of stood out to me a little bit because there's I, I still unfortunately follow crypto news regularly, uh, mostly at this point from pure schadenfreude standpoint. But there's been a lot of discussion around like regulations in the cryptocurrency space. And this is even if it's not regulations, it's at least somewhat related. And they said they're specifically going to go after illicit cryptocurrency exchanges the ransom where operators rely on. They're going to push for adoption of the anti-money laundering and countering the financial terrorism, which is AML slash CFT controls worldwide. And they ended with this quote saying, ultimately, the most effective way to undermine the motivation of these criminal groups is to reduce the uh, potential for profit. For this reason, the administration strongly discourages the payment of ransoms, which I mean, they've been saying this for a bit, but it's nice to see that on a paper signed by President Joe Biden, who I'm sure read every single bullet point in this one and helped author it as well, too. But it's, it makes sense. It's good. I wonder if cybersecurity insurance agencies ever read this. Sorry. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it's good to see them at least have a bullet point here for ransomware, considering that is honestly one of the biggest threats to a lot of organizations. I think they're doing a, a decent job. And I, you know, the one thing it crypto is harder to follow, but they they finally seem to be coming up to speed. They're, they've always been known for going after traditional crime by following the money and cutting off the money. So getting better in crypto is definitely going to help them. And they seem to be really increasing their capabilities. I'm curious what they'll do th with things like Monero, the ones that are less trackable. Are they going to start to try to block them or anything like that? Anyways, it'd be interesting to see how they continue to evolve. Yep. So moving on, pillar three, three, three fingers, uh, shape market forces to drive security and resilience. This is the one that, again, when you read through this, it 
totally makes sense, but it actually kind of stood out for me because it is a pretty radical shift from how things currently operate. And it's basically... <laughs> By the way, let, let's just... They're being tactful. This, this should be... Make Regulation. vendors have some <laughs> liability for their part. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you guys need to do your part is what they're essentially saying, I think. <laughs> yeah, it basically boils down to using regulations and incentives, so both the carrot and the stick, to modernize the digital ecosystem into one that's more resilient. And so this one will start with 3.1, which is hold the stewards of our data accountable. And this basically, it doesn't propose any new legislation, but it says that they fully support any GDPR-like regulations to protect personal data. They also say that any of these legislations uh, actions should uh, direct guidelines to follow NIST developed standards as well, too. So it's basically the government saying, hey, we need GDPR in the United States. We, we had a prediction for this a few years back. Uh, unfortunately, it still hasn't happened beyond the, the I mean, it, it, it has and... because the Cal CCPA and CCRA, which are two similar privacy laws in California, which do affect other states too, just because a lot of us have customers there. But I, I, I would hope they would actually do some work to actually make a federal version of this. And I mean, I'm just sick of how many breach notifications I get as a normal user that I have to change my credit card, change my password. Uh, my social security is now number is now public, and and there seems to be no no accountability. You for didn't all like these your three dollar check from Equifax. Uh, did I get one? I'm not sure if I joined the class action or however I, I got, got it. $3.18 from them. Wow. Uh, all yep. I know is what I've gotten over the past three weeks, good thing I froze my credit, is I have like about six in the same period of time people trying to open up uh, loans in my name. Thank you, Equifax and others who store social security numbers and lose it. Good thing I know how to freeze credit. Yep. Uh, 3.2 is drive the development of secure IoT devices. So saying the administration is going to continue to advance the development of an IoT security labeling program similar to like Energy Star uh, so that customers and consumers can compare uh, security protections offered by different IoT products and create a market that incentivizes greater security. Funny, Mark, maybe they are listening to us because I mentioned that GDPR comes to the US prediction. We also had regulate IoT as a prediction a year after. So, wow, <laughs> maybe we should work in the White House. Apparently Joe Biden listens to our podcast. <laughs> uh, 3.3 is the big one that stood out to me because it directly impacts WatchGuard, to be honest. Or uh, any company that makes or software. any company. <laughs> Shift liability for insecure software products and services. So it calls out that vendors that ignore best practices for secure development and ship products with insecure default considerations or known vulnerabilities are some of the biggest causes of security incidents. Like the burden is on the end user to implement the crappy insecure product and make sure it is secured, not the developer of it. And that's not fair. Uh, part of it is because, I mean, I assume we do it. I've not read our terms of use, but calls out the as is clauses that are in terms of use that basically allow software makers to leverage their position to disclaim all liability. If you sign up for Microsoft Office and when you accept the EULA, part of it is, you know, you're receiving this as it is, vulnerabilities and all, not our problem. Sorry if you get hacked. Um, so it says that while companies that make software must be free to innovate, they must also be liable for when they fail to live up to the duty of care they owe their customers. And they're going to work with Congress specifically uh, and the private sector to develop legislation establishing liability for software products. Uh, they're going to prevent manufacturers from fully disclaiming liability by contract. So get rid of those as is clauses and establish higher standards of care for software in specific high risk situations. Um, Says so the legislation must also, though, Shield companies from liability if they followed best practices in development, like the NIST Secure Software Development Framework. And the administration will encourage coordinated vulnerability disclosure across all technology types and sectors. So this one's like, for a small little section, it's kind of big impact of fundamentally changing how a lot of software sales and development works. Now, if, you're sure. a company, if your company's yeah. been doing it right, you're going to be in a much better spot. But if you're random whatever startup that is just trying to get something out the door and screw security till later, it's potentially going to cause problems. Yeah. Although not immediately. I, I mean, I, 
I think you and I like this, even though we work for a, a vendor who, you know, obviously we don't want to have a huge lawsuit that kills our business, but we, we think and would like to think we do things right. Uh, and I think this is important. I think it makes total common sense that the people that make insecure products should be liable for it. Uh, devil's in the details. I, I do like that they also have the, the you know, e immunity, so to speak, for people that do it it right but i'm curious to see the details there like i think if you're negligent you should be liable but there's going to be no perfect the best most secure organizations can also have breaches so it'd be interesting to see how this plays out and the reason i say it's not going to affect you immediately is none of this regulation exists for all of this strategy in 3.3 to happen it's got to be I assume does it have to go through Congress? I mean, there a regulation to has to be Congress, made, and that means a law in Congress. So I, I, I I'm hopeful for this idea. Uh, it may be a while away from being executed, but hopefully companies that are smart, I mean, uh, let's get to the next one, which talks about incentives too, because to me, as someone that cares about security and thinks we're a company that cares, I mean, we're a security company, so it really is our focus. But I, I would like to use this to help, uh, you know, when it's priority of features versus security, starting to use some of the incentives they offer to, to make sure that we push secure coding and secure uh, software development life cycles. Yep. So 3.4, as you just hinted at, is use federal grants and other incentives to build security. So this one was a little bit of a raw, raw go us thing where they highlighted a, some recent legislation as once in a generation investments in infrastructure and the digital supply chain with the CHIPS Act. But it basically, it says that they want additional grants and incentives specifically around cybersecurity research and development to try and make sure that we stay ahead of the game and that the federal government is helping out along the way too. And I think that to your point, Corey, totally makes sense, especially if you're going to pair this with potentially more regulations on software developers and manufacturers that it costs money to implement things like that. It'll help to have grants to go along the way to encourage R&D in that space as well, too. Or even examples of the government doing it right and sharing some of that. I, I, I do think I'm sure NIST has materials on secure. But anyways, it'd be nice. I, I think when it doesn't exist, it's not because no developer wants to do it. It's because everything you put time and money to takes time and money. And it's always at, at any sort of business, it's market forces driving a feature versus wanting to do it the right way, uh, which takes more time. Exactly. Uh, so 3.5, leverage federal procurement and improve accountability. So this is basically using the federal procurement process as an opportunity to drive cybersecurity improvements. So if you want to do business with the federal government or a contracting organization, then you've got to meet these certain standards. But the one half of this that really stood out to me was explicitly saying they're going to use the DOJ to go after entities under the False Claims Act if they fail to live up to their contrary, uh, contractually agreed cybersecurity commitments, including both development, monitoring, and reporting incidents. Basically, they said that you know, there's been times where like the companies we purchase from say, oh, yeah, we've got all these security things and all these whatever. They deliver the product or service. Yeah. Oracle. And then, you know, they get hacked and never report it. And so now they're saying we're going to go after those that claim one thing in the contract and then fail to live up to it. So, yay, they're finally enforcing stuff. But can I be cynic, Pop Pop, Corey, for a yes. second? Yay, for sure. But I just grabbed an energy drink a second ago that still says on the can that I'm going to lose weight because of it. Uh, <laughs> if, if our FDA or F, uh, yeah, FDA for drug and no, food, whatever the Food Administration is, if they can't hold people uh, products accountable for false claims there, uh, how is it more one that's about cybersecurity and secure coding, which consumers understand even less than how to lose weight. How, anyways, I, I, I want That's this, fair. I want I this, see what you're saying. but I've, I, they've so many products seem to have been able to make false claims. Doesn't goop things still cure cancer? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think in this one, it's more going to be like, cancer. I shouldn't say <laughs> they will still make false claims. But now if like a security incident happens, they're going to go back and read through. And if they find out that you weren't in alignment with something that you contractually agreed upon, they're going to lay the hammer down on you is how I read this one. Um, 
So rounding out pillar three, 3.6, explore a federal cyber insurance backstop. So again, recognizing that the federal government is in a position where they can help stabilize the economy and aid recovery in the event of a catastrophic cyber incident. And so they want to take this time to develop a package before it needs to happen instead of rushing to develop it after a cybersecurity incident occurs. Makes more sense to do it during peacetime than during wartime or catastrophe time, basically. And again, makes sense. We see government aid packages through FEMA for natural disasters. It only makes sense that we have a similar program for a cybersecurity disaster that could impact things like critical infrastructure or organizations or sectors where they can't help take care of themselves. Or the whole foundation of the internet, which might be a good segue to Pillar 4. <laughs> exactly. So Pillar 4 is invest in a resilient future. Basically leverage the National Science Foundation's Regional in in Innovation Engines program and several other grant programs to offer grants and drive R&D and cybersecurity. By the way, back on that, I, I, I'm jumping your 4.1. You'll introduce 4.1, but I just want to remind everyone uh, we had to take down the internet prediction with BGP and DNS too. So anyways, keep going, Mark. <laughs> so 4.1 is secure the technical foundations of the internet. And it starts out by specifically calling out how broken BGP and DNS are as critical as components well as of the internet. Is. Exactly. Uh, it says the federal government also needs to lead by example too. So they call it like IPv6 adoption and how it's slower than it really should be. And they're saying, well, the federal government needs to lead by example in this space too. So it's all about working with foreign and private sector partners to promote this kind of rules of the road that favors transparency, openness, and consensus, and then addressing some of the critical issues we have in the backbones of the internet, like BGP and DNS. So again, yeah, that was what, three years ago? Four years ago now, maybe? <laughs> I, I think prediction? we always have these prediction, like how do we do episodes a year after where we might get 60, 70, sometimes 80%. I we're think like it's 100% truly, now. We're like, if, if you go a few years beyond, we're almost 100% on everything. <laughs> exactly. Um, moving on, 4.2, reinvigorate federal research and development for cybersecurity. So they say they want to identify and prioritize R&D to mitigate cybersecurity risks in existing and next-gen technology, leverage some of those existing partnerships like the National Science Foundation, DOE, National uh, Laboratories, and other federal R&D centers to focus on investment in computer-related technologies, biotechnology and biomanufacturing, and clean energy technologies, and cybersecurity all in that space. So again, artificial intelligence. The one I yep. thought of while reading this, which will take us right to 4.3. Post-quantum future. Yeah, so 4.3 is <laughs> That's prepare the for our post-quantum future. And I couldn't help but I've thrown him under the bus a couple times here so far. There is a 0% chance that the gentleman that signed this uh, document knows anything about post-quantum computing and encryption. But hey, you know what? It's still good. Uh, so basically, it highlights the importance of strong encryption for global commerce and the risk that quantum, quantum computing will break some of the most ubiquitous encryption standards that we use every single day. Like the reality is if quantum computers actually become a thing, AES encryption and RSA key negotiations, are they're done. Um, so they're saying they want to accelerate investment in widespread replacement of hardware, software, and services that can be easily, uh, that can help protect against quantum, quantum computers, and that the federal government will prioritize transition of vulnerable public networks to quantum resistant cryptography. So this is one of those where it still feels like, you know, actually, I don't know, it doesn't feel like it's that far out. I feel like it's any day now we're going to find out that NIST or China or someone has developed a or or IB, I mean, weird yeah. IBM. I mean, you don't hear their name a lot, but they've invested and have one. And uh, yeah, uh, four out four is secure our clean energy future. And this one actually kind of stood out to me too. Basically, they're they're recognizing that we're in this space right now where as we adopt like clean energy and you know solar wind, all these renewable things, we're actually we have a spot to overhaul a lot of our uh, power distribution backbone that is frankly archaic at this point. So it calls out like some of the things they've done within power dis distribution for some of these new clean energy systems. And how this is a great opportunity to, as we are rolling out these new technologies, make sure we do it correctly, built with cybersecurity in mind, instead of doing a patchwork cybersecurity control 
after the fact, like we had to do with yeah, our old adding grid. smart grid to old energy systems that were never designed to be anything but air gapped is probably what introduced a lot of vulnerabilities. So whether like personally, I think clean energy is the obvious future, no matter your politics, even for economy, you worry about our economy. Well, damn, there's tons of money in clean energy. But the fact that it's brand new will finally allow us to overhaul an infrastructure that is older than time. Like we have probably a worse, the benefit was we probably had an energy grid before any other country, thanks to the, the folks that lived in the States. But I, ours is so old now because we built it so long ago and have just been band-aiding it. Uh, so I think I at, at first I'm like, is this just way, a way for Biden to talk about clean energy? But no, it, it totally makes sense. This can be a totally new grid that you can actually design modern security practices and modern uh, network connections on. Well, this is all your problem and not mine because I'm in Texas, which has the best power grid in the entire country oh, yeah. isolated just to ourselves that is totally. zero issues whatsoever except when it snows and you get that fifteen thousand dollar bill for two days yep or the ice storm that takes out power to the capital for two weeks anyways uh moving on 4.5 support development of a digital identity ecosystem so they recognize that enhanced digital identity makes access to government benefits and services easier uh, it also could enable trusted communications and, God forbid, more social networks with trusted identities. And then possibly a possibility for digital contracts and payment systems as well if you can actually authenticate the person. Like there's so much credit card fraud out there from just stealing credit card information and using it to buy crap online. What if you had a stronger identity than just a string of 16 numbers in a order to make A social security number? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Which we just Fewer talked numbers. about a second ago? Exactly. Maybe if you had a digitally signed certificates, people couldn't uh, open accounts under your name after Equifax loses all your information. Yes. So the quotes I want to pull out from here was today, the lack of secure, privacy preserving, consent based digital identity solutions allows fraud to flourish, perpetuates exclusion and inequity, and adds inefficiency to our financial activities and daily life. Operating independently, neither the private nor public sectors have been able to solve this problem. So basically, they're calling on a NIST-led effort for digital identity research to coordinate with private, the private sector to create strong, verifiable digital identity solutions for online. We've seen this in like other countries that tried things like you know, uh, ID cards with a, a smart card in them, effectively. Like there's no clear, obvious way to do this, but it makes sense. We do that, have like, biometrics in our passports, at least here in the U.S. Yep. I mean, you may not realize it, but if you got a passport in the last 10 years, there is a, a digital fingerprint in it. Oh, I didn't know there was a digital fingerprint. That's interesting. Now, there's a, uh, yeah. I got one of those fancy dual. I don't mean literally all. your finger fingerprint, but it, oh. it, it, it's a, a, there is a, a chip in it that has a digital certificate that's uh -huh. making yes. sure I it is really you your password. Literally stored my fingerprint. No, 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 no. Okay. I don't mean that. <laughs> well, that's less cool then. Uh, but either way, like it makes sense. Like the reality is, we are going very much online forward. For By the way, I, I totally promote this. Uh, but there is a, a one. This is more just pundit for fun commentary, Mark. How many people are? What is it? The mark of the devil. The whole chip our babies and and the, I feel like there's and a RFID class of plant my, uh... people that will like take this one and go kind of nuts with this is a perfect example of the government uh, uh, doing the mark of the beast or whatever. Fine, stay uh, off the internet. And I, I will admit, reading 1984, I hope this doesn't tie to a lot of intelligence tracking of you but you i do think digital I, I do think the actual digital identity is very important to your own personal security i think this is really mostly a benefit to citizens if if adopted and done well yeah absolutely uh and finally 4.6 develop a national strategy to strengthen our cyber workforce so basically they're focusing on reducing the cyber skills gap while improving diversity and increasing access to cyber educational training paths. They highlighted a few existing programs that they want to build off of. So the NICE program, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, and Cyber Corps, uh, uh, 
cyber scores, cyber cores scholarships for services, uh, basically a service program for the military. Uh, but specifically, they want to make sure that they expand the pool of candidates to include diversity in the country as well, too. I like this one. Seems like a no brainer, like the government's in a position to help out in the education space and get more folks in cybersecurity. We saw, I think it was last year, they started that, uh, what was it, like apprenticeship program they were trialing out as well, too. So clearly it is a focus of the federal government. Uh, hey, I think that's support. good. Anything that in it helps the next generation of folks to kind of come towards this industry would be helpful. Yep. All right. Pillar Start five. Uh, so the final pillar is forge international partnerships to pursue shared goals. Uh, so it started with a quote I wanted to highlight. The United, Sta the United States seeks a world where responsible state behavior in cyberspace is expected and rewarded and where irresponsible behavior is isolating and costly. Basically, they want to encourage international cooperation to promote good behavior on the Internet and disrupt the likes of some of those other nations they discussed earlier on which it feels like this is what we have to do. And it, it's probably we're gonna, where we're going to end up. Like a lot of these foreign countries are even becoming more isolationist where they want to be able to unplug their country's internet from the rest of the world's internet. Great firewall of China, North yep. Korea. So I, this totally makes sense. And let's start with 5.1, which is build coalitions uh, to counter threats to our digital Co ecosystem. Coalitions? Are you coalating things? Yes, coalating. <laughs> yes, thank you. So basically, <laughs> Had to. They, uh, they discuss several new international partnerships like the, oh boy, Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which is the US, India, Japan, and Australia, the nerdiest name I've ever heard. We have the five uh, eyes and we have the quadrilaterals. Yes, exactly. Uh, as well as the uh, Declaration for the Future of the Internet, or DFI, uh, to facilitate information sharing and develop an internet ecosystem that's based off of our shared values. And they want to make sure that we learn from everyone else's mistakes on security and resiliency and develop new law enforcement capabilities that work in the digital age going after cyber criminals. So, by the way, this uh, this makes total sense. I know that a lot of people in different countries, including nationalists in the United States, think it's uh, we only should worry about ourselves. But I think the internet and digital technology prove that we're global, everyone. I mean, th there are no boundaries to technology. If you're an astronaut, never looked at the Earth. We're all humans on this same tiny little blue dot. And so I, I think the idea of that you can secure yourself alone as this island and just cut off from the world, it's not only, you know, kind of silly, it's, it's detrimental to you. You get so much value from being connected to everyone. Technology has proven that, you know, the fact that we are having these discussions so easily on an hourly basis with po folks around the world is nothing but a benefit. So why aren't we working together in harmony? So anyways, folks that think it's uh, America first or America only, certainly we do have to take care of ourselves. But uh, I, I love Internet. I, I wish the, the countries that are kind of cutting themselves off would work with us, too, because they're part of the same small world. Yep. And it goes even beyond that in this, uh, this pillar as well, too. So 5.2 is strengthen international partner capacity. And it's basically using the United States position and power in this world to lift up our international partners, too, that share the same values in digital space. So that boils down to helping coordinate cyber capacity building and collaboration efforts, uh, the DOJ to continue to build a more robust international cybercrime program, and the Department of State to coordinate this whole of government effort and alignment with international partners. And this one's good too. Like the reality is we're pretty privileged here in the U.S. to have a lot of opportunity and strength within our government that can help other countries as well. It may be changing, but we have been perceived as the most powerful country, at least economically in the world forever. And we should use that power to empower other countries to, to do. Well, not forever, values. since like 1949. Well, I, by, by forever, I mean a long time. And to be clear, it's very likely good change quickly uh, with uh, one of the people that is more centered on themselves. <laughs> yeah. 
But continuing on from that last one, 5.3s expand the U.S.'s ability to assist allies and partners. So this pointed out some recent ransomware events in Costa Rica, Albania, and uh, Montenegro, where foreign partners might seek support from the United States, both in incident response uh, to investigate, as well as respond and recover to it as well. So they want to establish policies to determine when it's in the national interest to provide such support, create mechanisms to deploy department and agency resources rapidly, and also lead NATO efforts to build a virtual cyber incident response capability, at least within our NATO community too. And again, like you just said, like we're all in this together and it makes sense for us to help out other countries because we can also learn from that as well too along the way. So and I'd like to see one day, if there's a ransomware group in that particular country, maybe they're the ones that figure out the decryptor before us. It, it can go both ways, but you don't receive that help unless you show that you give it in return. Yep. Uh, 5.4, build coalitions to reinforce global norms of responsible state behavior. So this one, there's a quote I want to throw out from it where every member of the United Nations has made a political commitment to endorse peacetime norms and responsible state behavior in cyberspace that includes refraining from cyber operations that would intentionally damage critical infrastructure contrary to their obligations under international law. It says the U.S. is going to hold responsible states, uh, hold them accountable, hold other states accountable when they fail to uphold their commitments and drive meaningful consequences with their partners along the way. Basically saying, hey, you know, when we're at peacetime, don't go break our crap. Otherwise, we're going to come after you with the full force of the law and hopefully the United Nations behind us. I mean, we've already kind of started doing this, like trying to hold at least sanctioning Russia under the ground, North Korea is sanctioned under the ground. It's a bit tricky with some of the other ones, though, like China. We have a very uh, complex relationship with them, so that might be difficult to solve as well, too. Tactfully yeah. put. <laughs> I mean, it's complex. We are clearly rivals and in some case enemies, but at the same time, biggest trade partners yeah. with each other. I don't so, think we want to be enemies, but I, they, uh, before uh, we did mention values. They definitely have different values as far as censorship and control of... Yeah. But in the case of like cybersecurity incidents, like, I mean, before the whole Russia Ukraine war, it actually felt like that was improving with Russia actually cracking down on some ransomware operators within their country to our benefit. And unfortunately, that all evaporated in March of or February of last year. But I, I, I totally like this one. But, you know, the, the basic point is we need to reinforce norms by not being the one to do things that are wrong. But I do have to admit, things we've done in the past, while it wasn't damaging critical emphasis, I, I mean, Stuxnet. Stuxnet was one of the first times it should have been secret. The world never should have known <laughs> is really, I assume, the hope of the actors behind that one, Israel and U.S., most people agree. But, you know, that was an example of a country actually taking an aggressive action outside of wartime in a you know, very proactively in a country that they technically should have no control over. And while I, I actually agree with uh, trying to uh, control the weaponization of uranium, it I, I hope, that, you know, we have different uh, groups responsible for the government in the U.S. every four years. And it's this is a one that I believe in. But I think we also need to take seriously the times that we have gotten a little too aggressive ourselves because it, you know, could have been what opened Pandora's box and took off the gloves for other nations. Now, there have been, in my opinion, way more aggressive uh, breaks of norms. I mean, Nation states going after money, going after healthcare care uh, with ransomware, wanna cry that are horrible. And we definitely as as a United Nations need to fix that. But as we start to take off the gloves saying that we will more aggressively react to other people's bad actions, we need to realize that it react is OK. But if we're if we're the first ones doing it quietly, uh, we don't want to be the bad norm. <laughs> yeah, that I think that's sense. very well said. Yep. <laughs> um, man, it, it kind of sucks being the first in that case. It does feel a little bit like throwing stones in glass houses. But at the same time, like it is 
what we do going forward, I think that's going to make that. Yeah, yeah. You, we can't change the this. past, and maybe we've realized the reality of of what the results of things like nation states getting more red teamy in the past have done. So I, I love this. We can't fix the past going forward. This sounds good to me. <laughs> yep. So rounding out our one hour and ten minute podcast with five dot five is secure global supply chains for information, communications, and operational technology products and services. And my uh, AKA for this one is get out of China is basically what the whole section felt like. Do we have basically, to get out of Taiwan too? <laughs> so they say that, I think so. That's Probably. part of it. They say the U.S. is too reliant on global supply chains for everything from raw materials and finished products and services. It highlights some existing legislative action um, and executive um, orders like the build a build America and buy America for federally funded products. But it says the U.S. needs to work with our international partners to shift supply chain flows through partner countries as trusted vendors. I think we're seeing a lot of this. Like I just read an article today about like Apple shifting iPhone production from China to India. And it seems like that seems to be like a tide that is slowly starting to turn where. This needs to be incentivized, unfortunately, yeah. I think, because I honestly businesses did this to America, not the government. Uh, I, I <laughs> I'm sure even my owners won't love this, but it, it's greed of businesses. I mean, still this day, if you go into rooms that are talking about P&L, it's about uh, offshoring to lower cost development centers. And that's why we moved chip manufacturing to China. And the law, it's a stupid short term strategy because now China's economy is stronger. They know how to make all these chips and they're going to be the leader in the world. And I, I, I agree with this one. But it's going to have a much higher cost in the United States. And the while I think that's actually good for the economy, it's good for the actual American citizens, the middle class, the lower class that work, having actually funds to buy things because more jobs are coming and they might be high skilled jobs. I, I, business owners, the one percent sure does not seem to be on board for this one. So I, I agree with it. But I actually think it's the people that drive trying to get things for nothing or close to nothing that have kind of ruined the state of our, our manufacturing in the United States. And uh, yeah, we'll see I'm what with happens. You on that one. And it feels like the CHIPS Act is like a very, very small start to this, but it's going to take way more than that in order to bridge the gap. But it also it doesn't necessarily mean we have to bring it to the United States itself. Even just going with more friendly partner nations. Ones that is, share the values, so to speak. Exactly. Is better than where we are currently at. So that was the uh, the overview of the national cybersecurity strategy out of the White House. And like all things considered, like there's a lot of it and it's like, no, duh. But at the same time, there's some new items in it. that, And overall, I agree with the strategy that they're at least proposing. So well considered. And strategy is supposed to be high level things. I the The... The main thing is just seeing how it gets executed. That's always my worry, especially in the United States, because this is an administration that's going to be up for a new vote in a year and a half. Uh, we have a situation where to do half of these things, you're going to need leg legislation. And you have a Congress that's not even trying to agree, where literally, you know, if one side likes it, the other one doesn't like it simply because it's not their side. So... I love it. It's going to uh, be in tough. In theory, I, I, I would like to see, it'd be interesting to see how it goes from this point on. And as 39 or 38 pages of this document were dedicated to the actual like strategy and stuff, there is one single page dedicated to the implementation of it. So it is a, it's going to be a long, long road to get to really any of this. But if this strategy at least survives through the next administration, whenever that is or whatever that is, I feel like it's a good building point to go forward. And hopefully this does not become a partisan issue for our To country. be positive, any large journey starts with the first step. And this is a pretty big first step. So, And this really shouldn't be partisan. This feels very common sense security, which everyone should get. So hopefully we can get over the partisan differences we have and agree that cybersecurity is, is important to the future of society and economy. Well, unfortunately, that'll never happen. So. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> <coughs>
we have to end in the normal four four three downer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. If you have any questions on today's topics or suggestions for future episode topics, you can reach out to us on Twitter, but it'll cost you $8 a month. I'm at X-O-R-R-O underscore. We only reply to blue checkmark people. Sorry. Corey is at Secadept, and the both of us are at hashtag the 443 podcast. Thanks again for listening, and you will hear from us next week. But you can't use MFA if you want to t- reach out to us on Twitter. But Or you can. Just need to get Authpoint or Google Authenticator. Screw that text. Stuff. And cut. No, I have more. But wait.